Hey apes, welcome to the lecture about land use. We're going to focus on um, public lands and private lands, um, truthfully mainly public lands, and um, how people use them, how they're legislated, and um, how they're conserved. Human land use affects the environment. Um, that seems to be an obvious statement. So communities use a number of methods, including legislation, to regulate public and private land use. To understand land use conflicts, we're going to examine three main ideas um, in uh, land use. Number one is the tragedy of the commons, which you're going to be doing a lab on. Um, number two is the idea of externalities, which if you've taken economics, you've probably heard of before. If you haven't, you probably have not heard of that. And then the idea of maximum sustainable yield. Land has traditionally been viewed as a common resource for anyone to use for purposes such as foraging, growing crops, felling trees, hunting, mining, or grazing livestock. But as the human population increased, these common lands became degraded by overgrazing, overharvesting, and deforestation. So the idea of the tragedy of the commons is the tendency of a shared, limited resource to become depleted, that should say depleted, not deplete, to become depleted because people act from self-interest for short-term gain. So let me break down, and we're going to read the actual Garrett Hardin article, but the in British history, villages had a village commons that was at the center. And the village commons was a patch of land that could be used by anyone who was a villager for grazing livestock, uh, whatever you were going to do there. Now, mostly it was for grazing livestock. Sometimes part of it was used for growing crops, but mostly it was for grazing livestock. And it was actually called the King's Common because that land actually belonged to the king and it was for use by all the villagers. Uh, what happened over time as these, you know, villages grew and developed was that that land became kind of a, a no man's land, a free for all, because since no one owned it, no one took care of it. No one took ownership of it. And so people um, did bad things to the land. They overgrazed it because they, the idea is, well, if I don't graze it, somebody else is going to uh, get that benefit. Um, they dumped their waste on it. Um, that's the area, the commons was the area where criminals were executed. Um, so it kind of became this um, this area that was, was kind of unsavory. And so the land was degraded because no one looked after it. That's the idea of the commons. Uh, and this happens because the rules for um, use of a common resource are either not agreed upon ahead of time or they're not enforced. Um, there's no way to police that. The concept of the tragedy of the commons applies to any publicly available resource that isn't regulated or for which regulation is available, but regulation isn't enforced. And this includes uh, common land, air, and water resources. So let's examine the concept of an externality. An externality is a cost or a benefit of a good or service that is not included in the purchase price of the good or service. And in fact, pretty much everything that we buy, whether that's an actual good or a service from someone, the, the true cost of that good or service is hidden. These externalities are passed on um, in different ways. So we're especially concerned with negative externalities because they lead to serious environmental damage for which no one is held legally or financially responsible. So the tragedy of the commons is an example of a negative externality. So each user of a common resource, whether that's land, air, or water, contributes to the total harm done to the resource. However, if the resource can continue to support exploitation, then each individual user doesn't suffer the consequence of their own overuse. The cost is passed on or the cost is externalized to others. Solutions to the tragedy of the commons include private ownership of common resources, uh, legislation and regulation of the resource, and community level management by user-led institutions. So um, let me just talk to you a little bit about um, the idea of land held in common for grazing or for uh, growing crops is kind of a familiar one. But when we talk about the oceans as being a global commons, so um, 
countries own the water rights and the fishing rights uh, to a portion of their coastlines. But then after, uh, I believe it's a two mile mark, I'm not 100% sure on that, but after where that ownership stops, it's what they call international waters. And in international waters, that is where the global commons begins. And it's, uh, um, there, it's not owned by anyone, which means it's used or exploited by all. The same is true with the atmosphere. Um, no one owns the atmosphere. It's shared by everyone. And so pollution from one nation or from one community can be passed on and usually is passed on in, in an externality to other communities. Um, pollution doesn't stay just above your own community. Um, it's spread throughout the global commons. Maximum sustainable yield of a renewable resource is the maximum amount that can be harvested without compromising the future availability of that resource. So it's the amount that you can take from a species or an environment um, that will still allow the breeding stock to regenerate and, and for offspring to be produced. The maximum sustainable yield, or MSY, is, is what um, environmental scientists usually say. MSY varies by resource. The general rule of thumb is that the MSY is the amount of harvest that keeps the resource population at about one half of the carrying capacity of the environment. Um, there's, there's actually, that, that idea has been tested before. So um, knowing that MSY is one half of the capacity environment, I can imagine a test question with something like that on a graph and you're asked to identify what that point is and that would be maximum sustainable yield. In reality, maximum sustainable yields are really difficult to precisely calculate since there are a lot of factors that influence the growth and reproduction rate of a species, as well as the carrying capacity of an environment. Um, these are usually, they're, they're, they're estimates um, for any given species. Now they might be pretty good estimates or they might not be good estimates at all. Um, and they're, they're subject sometimes to political influence. So if there's a, if there's a reason that a, that a lobby group or somebody would want a, a sustainable yield or sustainable catch, um, we call it maximum sustainable catch when we're talking about fisheries. If there's a reason that a, that a group would want that maximum sustainable yield increased or decreased, um, these can be actually revised due to political pressures as well, um, where you know science and politics get muddled. And hey, that never happens, right? Um, international categories of public lands. So in 2000, the 2003 United Nations list of protected areas classifies protected lands into six major categories. And some of these are the same as U.S. protected lands and some are not. So um, international categories of public lands are national parks, managed resource protected areas, habitat or species protected areas. Um, this should say strict, not struct. This right here should say strict. S-T-R-I-C-T, strict nature reserves and wilderness areas, protected landscapes and seascapes, and national monuments. And so let's look at each one of these in turn. National parks are managed for scientific, educational, recreational, and aesthetic use. Aesthetic use means uh, just basically it's a, it's a beautiful area or it has unique scenery and so it's protected. Most national parks are not used for extractive resources such as tum timber or, or, or fossil fuels. Uh, many parks protect endangered species, and some parks were designed with that endangered species in mind, meaning that um, there's an endangered species there and they made a park around it to protect it. And this is especially true with national parks in Africa. Africa has a lot of unique and endangered species, and national parks are established um, in order to protect those species. National parks provide revenue from, for, from tourism, and this is true in the United States, but it's especially true in the developing world. Um, in a lot of developing nations, um, their national parks are one of the few remaining areas that are wild in the country because a lot of the area has been subject to degradation, and it doesn't look like what tourists expect it to look like. So they take the tourists to national parks and, you know, you get wild Africa or wild Australia and you get that, that feel of um, what things used to look like 
On the negative side, however, the establishment of a national park boundary often pushes indigenous people off their ancestral lands. So um, indigenous people and animals often live side by side. And when national parks are established, uh, usually the, the indigenous people are removed from the national park boundaries, and that is um, very detrimental to their communities. Okay, so managed resource protected areas allow for the sustained use and or harvesting of biological, mineral, and recreational resources. Now they're protected, but they're protected um, for a resource, and that resource is managed. So in the United States, our national forests are a good example of this type of classification. Um, the National Forest Service and our national forests were actually created in order to protect our timber resources. And we harvest a quite a bit of timber from national forests. Habitat and species management areas are actively managed to maintain biological communities from environmental threats such as fires, predators, etc. So um, in these particular areas, there's a species or a habitat that's important and needs to be protected. And um, the park is established or the management area is established to maintain the biological integrity of that habitat or species. Here I actually spelled it correctly, yay me. Strict nature wild reserves and wilderness areas. So strict nature wild reserves and wilderness areas are established to protect species or entire ecosystems from, excuse me, habitat destruction, hybridization with domesticated livestock or whatever it happens to be. Um, when they say strict, they mean they're, they're actually not allowing um, um, contact with non-natives there and non-native um, animals, non-native or organisms, and they're um, trying to maintain biological integrity. So um, this one would be one level up in terms of biological integrity from habitat and species management areas. Protected landscapes and seascapes provide for the non-destructive use of natural resources for, with opportunities for tourism and recreation. So the Great Barrier Reef is one of these. Um, protected landscapes would be something terrestrially that's particularly, particularly interesting, and it needs to be managed um, to keep it free from development and overuse. The same thing would be true with the seascape. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is a wonderful thing um, to, to view, and you can go snorkeling or scooping to look at it, but it needs to be managed um, to maintain its biodiversity, to make sure it's not overused, and to make sure tourists aren't destructive. National monuments are set aside to protect unique sites of special natural or cultural interest or historical landmarks. And it's the same way that we use those in the United States. National monuments are going to be natural or cultural, and a lot of times they're historic landmarks. Okay, so that was international categories of public lands. Now let's talk a little bit about public lands specifically in the United States. In the U.S., public lands include rangelands, national forests, national parks, national wildlife refuges, and wilderness areas. The U.S. management of public land is based on what we call resource conservation ethic. This is actually an important idea right here. Um, it wasn't started that way. Um, you do not need to know the detailed history of, the, of the, the public land movement in the United States, but we operate under the resource conservation ethic, which states that People should maximize um, the use of the resource based on the greatest good for everyone. And when we say everyone, we mean humans, we mean animals, we mean um, any of the stakeholders that might use a resource. You can imagine that this idea kind of gets dicey a little bit because there's going to be competing interests that want to use that land. Um, tourism might conflict with timbering, timber resources. Timber resources might conflict with uh, backpack hiking, um, you know, backpacking. Backpacking might conflict with ATV or um, all-terrain vehicle use. So there's a lot of different um, organizations or kind of groups of people who want to use land. And our conservation ethics says that we need, we need to try to maximize the greatest amount of good for everyone. So I um, think we can get into conflict in this way. Many land use, and that's exactly what the next bullet points about, many land uses conflict with each other. So the United States has adopted the idea of what we call multi-use or multiple use lands. Um, and these lands can be used for grazing, timber harvesting, recreation, and mineral extraction. 
Some public lands, however, are not multiple use lands and they're protected in order to maintain a watershed, preserve wildlife and fish populations, maintain sites of scenic, scientific, and historical value. So again, these are competing interests here in our multi-use lands. These guys often come into conflict. Some public lands are specifically set aside and those would be our wildlife refuges and our wilderness areas. We'll talk more about that um, so that people can't mess with, um, with the ecological functioning or the biological resources. And this is just a little infographic of land usage in the U.S. by percentage. This is the year 2000. Um, this is also reproduced in your book. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, remember that any graph that is um, in a PowerPoint presentation or in your textbook is fair game for a reading quiz or a exam. So um, land usage, you can see that the, the greatest percentage here is forest land. Um, and this is from the USDA. And then the second is gr grassland, pasture, and range. And these um, breakdowns are not exactly the same as they are in your textbook. So I would encourage you to take a peek at the textbook one. Okay, land management practices. Um, how do So we're going to go through kind of the different land, uh, public land uh, categories that we talked about that we outlined here a couple of slides ago. And we're talking about what we do with them. Rangelands is the first one that we're going to talk about. Well, what is a rangeland? It's a dry, open grassland, primarily used for the grazing of livestock. They're concentrated in the western part of the United States. They're semi-arid. Um, you know, you could that you call them chaparral. They're um, they're usually low trees or or brush kind of areas. Um, they're low on the precipitation, so fires occur naturally in these ecosystems. Farming on the lands isn't possible, they're too dry. So grazing offers an economic use for the land. Grazing can also reduce feedlot emissions associated with CAFOs. I've already talked about CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, when you have a bunch of animals jammed together into a CAFO, you have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly methane from cow farts. And um, so when you spread them out on pasture, it's healthier for the animal, it's healthier for the environment. However, poorly managed stock can also damage stream beds and they also pollute surface water. Um, guys, cows are big. Cattle are really big creatures. Um, they, they're um, ungulates, so they're, they, are, they have these little pointy hooves. Um, so when you have pointy hoof animals that weigh lots and lots of pounds, they tend to press their hooves really strongly into the ground. They can cause erosion by, by um, uh, digging up the dirt. They can also cause soil compactation, but they're particularly hard on stream beds because cows like to be in the water. So when they go down into the water, they mess up the stream bed and they put a bunch of dirt in there. And then when we come back up out of the water, they mess up the stream bed and dig a lot of dirt out of there. So they contribute to um, soil erosion along the banks, to the loss of vegetation along the banks, and silt pollution in the water. Um, they often strip vegetation down to their roots in their grazing habit, um, which means that the plant can't regenerate, and that leaves the land vulnerable to wind erosion. The Bureau of Land Management, or what they call the BLM, oversees rangelands in the United States. They're in charge of the rangelands. Rangelands operate on a permit basis. The problem with the permits, however, is that the cost of obtaining a grazing permit is extremely low. I forget the actual cost, but it's some ungodly number, like 30 cents an acre or something like that. The Bureau of Land Management spends much more, like seven times more in managing the lands that it receives than in managing the lands than it receives in permit fees. So the permit fees don't even begin to cover um, the land management. And I will tell you that there is not enough BLM oversight in public rangelands. It's just, it's a known problem. Um, the BLM is understaffed and it's underfunded. So if you have those two problems, you're not going to have a lot of oversight for grazing. Um, this has led to overgrazing on rangelands and most environmental scientists agree that our western rangelands are overgrazed and they're in poor um, environmental health. And this is due to a lack of oversight and overgrazing, um, lack of oversight by the BLM and overgrazing by the folks who are who have the permits. It's the tragedy of the commons, folks. Okay, forests. Forests are ecosystems that are dominated by trees or woody vegetation. Y'all already know what a forest is. We talked about biomes already. 
about three quarters of forests in the US that are used for commercial timber are actually privately owned. So most of our timber, so about 75% of our timber comes from privately owned land. The other 25 comes from primarily our national forests. U.S. National Forests were originally established to ensure a reliable source of timber, and logging is still allowed in National Forests today. That surprises a lot of students that um, we would have something that they consider a protected land where you can still cut down trees, but that was the original intent, was to protect timber resources for use, um, for managed use. Timber companies that log in national forests pay a royalty on their revenues to the U.S. Forest Service. But like with rangelands, the cost of managing their lands far exceeds the royalties that the, that, um, the government receives from the, um, the timber companies. So again, it's like, it's basically just subsidized land use. The timber companies pay a tiny, tiny um, royalty on their revenue and um, the US government subsidizes the rest in terms of land management for national forests. So let's talk about how trees are taken down out of forests, whether that's private or public. There's the Lorax over there. Remember, he speaks for the trees. Timber harvest practices include clear cutting. Um, I put the Lorax on here because, of course, clear cutting is what you think of when, when you think of the Lorax. Clear cutting removes all or almost all of the trees within a given area. It is the easiest and the most economical harvest method. Um, once the trees are harvested, foresters usually reseed or replant the area, uh, and that's usually reseeded or replanted with a single species. Since the trees um, in that replanted area were all planted at once, they are all the same age, and they will all, of course, be of the similar size. These are called tree plantations. The replanting process often uses herbicides to get rid of brushy undergrowth, which can lead to herbicide contamination in local waterways. So in a tree plantation, you don't want anything growing there except for trees, because if you have brushy undergrowth, it makes harvesting the trees harder. So they use an herbicide to kind of kill everything um, that might grow up and around the trees that would impede um, harvest. So the herbicides can get into local waterways. Generally, the seed seedlings are planted, that are planted are fast-growing species of trees like lodgepole pines that thrive in full sunlight. And of course, they're going to be in full sunlight because the rest of the forest cover is gone. This is now a bare area. Clear cutting, not so great environmentally. It results in a huge reduction of biodiversity, both directly, like we cut down trees and so we're losing species there. And of course, all the species that were in the forest that were not trees are also gone and the animals are gone. So that's direct, result, direct biodiversity hit. But also biodiversity is impacted through habitat fragmentation meaning um, species that, that are in the area that may not have been directly in the patch that they logged, um, they're not gonna go through that clear cut area. Animals are gonna avoid that area, and so we get habitat fragmentation, um, which leads to all kinds of environmental problems. We talked about um, how breeding stocks are fragmented uh, due to these you know, um, breeding islands and all that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of issues with ha habitat fragmentation. This also increases wind and water erosion, which leads to a loss of soil and soil nutrients. So increased erosion of the, uh, the soil adds silt to streams and rivers, which can harm aquatic populations. And the denuded slopes are also prone to mudslides. Um, there's been some very famous mudslides that killed a bunch of people um, because they were logging on the slopes above and, the, and there were no trees to hold uh, the soil in place. So when the rains came, psh, the, the mud just buried the village at the bottom. Selective cutting is a better, uh, in terms, I say better, that's not a good apes term, but it is a less environmentally destructive way to harvest trees. Um, selective cutting is the removal of a single tree or a relatively small number of trees from a larger forest area. Remember, if this is a natural forest, there's only gonna be certain trees that you want out of the forest, what they call economically viable species. And the others are not gonna be economically viable. So rather than cutting down the entire forest to get at the things that you want in the forest, they just go in and remove the trees that they want. Because only a few trees are removed, when the small open areas are replanted, the forest still contains trees of different ages. This preserves biodiversity, 
but because the new seedlings must grow beside larger, more mature trees, um, the seedlings that are planted can only be shade tolerant species because there's gonna be um, other bigger trees that might shade them out. While selective cutting is overall a better ecological choice for timber harvest, there are some negative effects of selective cutting and many of them are the same as they are for clear cutting. Uh, first off, in order to get into a forest, you need to build roads for logging equipment, and that's true in both forestry methods. That leads to habitat fragmentation and a, res a reduction in biodiversity. Roads, animals don't like roads through their forests. Uh, soil compactation is also a, an issue from the use of heavy equipment. Logging is not done. Um, it's done with, with large, um, large machinery now. So the machinery, as, they, as it rolls over the forest floor, is going to press down on the dirt and the dirt can get compacted. Ecologically sustainable forestry is a pr an approach to logging that seeks to remove trees from forests in ways that reduce the impact to non-commercial tree species and preserve biodiversity while reducing soil erosion and compactation. And of course, your book showed a picture of a dude harvesting a tree with a team of horses. That's how forestry used to be done. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't want to characterize, you know, back in the day uh, forestry was sustainable because most of the time they were clear cutting it. But um, the use of heavy equipment and, you know, the need to build roads it can definitely be um, detrimental. So uh, finding ways to reduce um, the collateral effects of logging. Uh, logging itself is pretty detrimental, so um, if we don't have to build roads, if we don't have to use heavy equipment, that can all reduce the overall effects of logging environmentally. Fire management. So in many ecosystems, fire is a natural process that's important for nutrient cycling and regeneration. Fire is a big thing in apes. Um, there's a lot of ecosystems that are out of balance because we don't allow them to burn. For many years, the policy of the U.S. Forest Service was total fire suppression. When I was a kid in the 70s, okay, you can think, yep, I'm old. But when I was a kid in the 70s, um, we had a big Smokey the Bear campaign. Um, they were they talked you know, a lot about only you can prevent forest fires, and they did not allow forests to burn. Well, the suppression, the total suppression of forest fires is a bad thing because most ecosystems need periodic fires in order to be kind of a, kind of reset. So what happens when we don't let things burn? Well, there's an accumulation of dead biomass on the forest floor. Fires are inevitable. Whether they're started by man or started by lightning, they happen where they're in forests. Um, so when fire ine inevitably sweeps through a forest that has not been allowed to burn, there's a lot of dead stuff on the ground, and that means there's a lot of fuel to fire that, um, that, that, to fire that fire, fuel to fire the fire, yeah. So what is a prescribed burn? How can, we, how can we stop these forest fires from having too much um, a bio, dead bi biomass to burn? Well, we can get rid of it ourselves. Um, that's done through a prescribed burn, which is a fire that's deliberately set under controlled conditions. Um, prescribed burns, they help to reduce the amount of accumulated dead biomass uh, so that when fires do occur, there's less to be burned. They also help to control pest population and they reduce brushy and often invasive understory plant species. So prescribed burns are very helpful. We're kind of mimicking the natural fire cycle of um, certain ecosystems. Uh, so in the Yellowstone area in 1998, there were massively destructive forest fires, much of which were um, they were so bad. And one of the reasons they were so bad was because we had suppressed forest fires in the Yellowstone ecosystem for so many years. The ecosystem around Yellowstone is designed to be reset through forest fires. Through, I say forest fires, but fires in general, grassland fires and forest fires. And because we did not allow the area to burn for so many years, there was a lot of dead biomass that was on the ground. So when, they, when it did catch fire, it just burned out of control. But this is not just something that happened back in the day in 98. Um, much of the Western United States is on fire right now. California is seriously on fire right now. Like it is burning. Um, 2017, 2016, California is in a major drought and things have been very, very dry there. There's been wildfires across the United States in 2016 and 2017. And like I said, California has got 
some really bad ones burning right at this moment. Okay, so U.S. national parks. We talked about national parks in the international sense, the U.S. national parks. Um, in terms of what they are and why they're set aside, they're similar to the international um, uh, national parks. However, remember we're going up along with that resource conservation ethic, which, which says they need to be multi-use. So, national parks are generally established to preserve scenic views and unusual landforms. Yellowstone was the first national park. It was established in 1872. There are currently 58 national parks. The National Park Service manages the national parks. And of course, we have the multi-use principle, resource conservation ethic, which guides the management of national parks as it does for national forests. The National Park Service began an e ecology ethic in the 1960s. So the parks were used, before the 1960s, they were used um, I almost want to say semi-commercially. Um, they were much more built up than they are today, and they were much less wild. Um, if you've ever seen the Yogi Bear cartoons, I don't know if y'all have ever seen Yogi Bear cartoons, but the Yogi Bear cartoons, you know, they were set in what they, a fictional national park called um, Jellystone, which was, of course, a takeoff of Yellowstone. And in that cartoon, Yellowstone is kind of, it's kind of built up. It's like, you know, it's almost like a tourist area. And while the national parks are tourist areas, Yellowstone today is actually quite a bit wilder than it was um, in the middle of this century, over the last century of the 20th century because of this ecology ethic. So in the 1960s, the Park Service began to feel like they wanted to return the parks back to the way they used to be before um, the European settlers came. So the quote was actually the same biotic condition as they were found first found by European settlers. Now, that's not actually possible. Nice thought, but not possible. Um, the principle, however, is still followed today. So our national parks are, are pretty wild places, um, and they're wilder than now than they used to be 60, 50, 60 years ago because of this ecology ethic. Um, each national park is unique. Uh, they have very unique characteristics, and I've visited um, 22 of the 58 national parks. So I can tell you, at each one of them, there's a good reason they were established. There's something amazing about every one, and they, they really have their own character. And each park has to be managed according to its specific needs. And those needs can be environmental, economic, ecological, whatever that happens to be. Each park is very unique. Humans love to go see the quote unquote wilderness. And of course, human overuse can degrade um, these wild lands. Remember, of course, we got this multi-use multi um, ethic. And so we have to uh, try to please everybody with how we use our national parks. So um, ATVs, all-terrain vehicles, are always a source of controversy in US national parks. Um, they tend to um, cause soil erosion and they're very loud. So um, while it's kind of cool to ride an ATV in a national park, many of them are banned because um, of their environmental and aesthetic effects. And of course, um, even camping, hiking, and mountain biking can be done to excess. So, you know, if you're not careful, if you have too many uh, campers or hikers or even too many mountain bikes on your trails, you can have a degradation of, of, a, of a land. You also can get air pollution from excess vehicle traffic while driving through the parks. I will tell you that in the summer of 2016, I spent um, a good week and a half in Yellowstone and tour buses go through Yellowstone. I mean, not small tour buses, but like the big tour buses. They run on diesel and they move slowly because the roads are windy and narrow and it was no fun. It was just no fun being behind one of those big tour buses. They belch diesel smoke into the air. Um, you know, it's it. That's definitely something that you know decreases the the sense of being in a wild land is being behind a you know tour bus that's belching diesel into the air. All right, so let's talk about wildlife refuges and wilderness areas. National wildlife refuges are the only federal public lands that are specifically managed for the protection of wildlife. Um, all our other categories so far are managed um, for multi-use or for, <coughs> excuse me, for primarily for human use. National wilderness areas and wildlife refuges, they're managed for wildlife. 
National wilderness areas are set aside with the intent of preserving large tracts of intact ecosystems. This is really where we can actually see how things used to be and how uh, species and both the biotic and abiotic parts of an ecosystem, how they used to interact. Wilderness areas are amazing resources. Both wildlife refugees and refugees, refuges and wilderness areas allow only very limited human use and they are mandated as roadless, meaning that you can drive into the area to a certain point, but then the roads stop and you have to hike anywhere further that you want to go or go by helicopter. And some people do, especially like camera crews when they're filming. Now, there are areas where the road was built prior to the establishment of the refuge or, wild, or wilderness area. And those roads, they're allowed to remain and they're allowed to continue to be used if they were built and in use prior to the establishment of the area. 60% of our U.S. wilderness um, areas are in Alaska. And that, of course, makes sense. Alaska's got some amazing places and their ecosystems are uh, precious. All right, so... We've talked about categories of uh, land, both international and domestic, and we've talked about um, uh, how we use those lands. Now let's talk about federal regulation of how we use land. Well, the biggest piece of federal -like regulation for land use is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Um, this, this act mandates an environmental assessment of all projects involving federal money or federal permits. So basically, if you are going to take federal money or um, use a federal permit, you've got to go, you're, you're under the auspices now of NEPA. NEPA rules require that land developers file what they call an EIS or an environmental impact statement. So what is that? Before you can do any project or any work um, on federal land, you have to submit this EIS, which outlines the scope and the purpose of the project. It explains the environmental context of the project. It suggests alternative approaches to the project, like if this project was not approved, what else could be done? And it analyzes the environmental impact of each of the alternatives that would be proposed to the, to the project at hand. Uh, they're fairly lengthy documents. Um, most of them are written in legalese, but uh, they are designed to kind of think critically about how a project might, inf um, might, might inf impact um, federal land and the environmental aspects of that, and then perhaps to think a little bit more critically about other ways that we might be able to do something without harming the land. Sometimes permission and development funds may be withheld until the developer submits an environmental mitiga mitigation plan, which explains how the developer plans to address the project's environmental impact. So let's be clear about the, the EIS. Just because your project has kind of a kind of a negative EIS, like let's say you want to do a project in um some of the environmental uh, aspects of it are not going to be great. I mean, they're not going to be great for the environment. So you know, you're thinking, man, I'm really not going to get this project approved um, by the government because there's some really negative things about my project. <laughs> Think again, friend. That might not be the case. Um, NEPA doesn't say that you're that you won't get the contract just because there's negative environmental consequences. It just says that you have to be aware of them and provide alternatives for them. You know, before you begin, like you've thought them through. It doesn't say you have to necessarily um, not do your project because there's going to be something bad to the environment. Now, if something is really going to be detrimental the, to the environment or if it's a protected area that, um, that perhaps NEPA decides um, that it, it's not going to be... Um, it's going to be too, too detrimental to that, that protected area. They might want you to do an environmental mitigation plan saying, okay, you know, we know your project's going to be harmful to the environment and we're going to give you a contract, but we want to know what you're going to do about this one bad aspect that's going to be really bad for the environment. It's going to harm species or create soil pollution or, you know, deplete groundwater or whatever it happens to be. Um, how are you going to plan for that, Right. So additionally, if there's an endangered species within the proposed area of development, then um, the Endangered Species Act has to be brought in 
to make sure that the species is protected. So if there's something that you're proposing and there's an endangered species in the area, you also are bound by the Endangered Species Act. So up until now, we've been talking about um, public land use, the regulations that um, govern public land use, and um, kind of the ethic that drives it. Like why, how do we use the land, this multi-use ethic or the um, for public lands. So we're gonna switch over to residential land use, which is kind of a, a different side of the coin. This is how people use land to live on. The United States experienced increased urbanization um, around 100 years ago. So about 100 years ago, people that were living in rural areas began moving into cities. In the last 50 years or so, people have been moving again away from those cities into uh, suburbs or exurbs. So let's define what a suburb or an exurb is. Um, there's those words right there. A suburb is an area that surrounds a metropolitan area that has a lower population density relative to the metropolitan area. And if I say suburb, you guys can all kind of picture that. Mesquite is actually a suburb of Dallas. Um, if you go to the north, we've got, you know, Dallas, and you've got places like Richardson and Plano and Frisco. All of those are suburbs of Dallas. Then we have an area, um, an idea called an exurb. It's similar to suburb. Like if you were kind of dropped from the sky down into the middle of an exurb, you might not be able to be able to tell it apart from a suburb. But an exurb isn't connected to an urban area or to a central city. So it's kind of a... Um, a neighborhood or a residential area that's popped up that's not directly related, like you wouldn't say it's a metropolitan area of a larger city. So urban sprawl is um, urbanized areas that have spread into rural areas without clear boundaries. So urban areas, as they grow, they tend to spread out into rural areas, take up those areas, and the boundary between the city and what used to be the countryside is no longer clear. So, and that would be the suburban areas, really. The landscape, um, if you were to characterize urban sprawl, what you would be looking at is clusters of residential areas, retail shops and office parks, and what we call these big box stores, like Walmarts, Targets, Best Buys, um, Circuit Cities, those, well, Circuit City's gone, but those big, like if you were to look at these strip centers, it's the big store that's in the corner. Marshalls, Ross, um, TJ Maxx, um, the Michaels, PetSmart, those kind of big box places, like the big anchor ones in strip centers. And these strip centers and residential areas are separated by miles and miles of feeder roads, freeway feeder roads, and large parking lots. So the parking lots are right there in front of the retail and um, you know there'll be clusters of residential development behind it. Urban sprawl has some significant environmental consequences. Um, I'm gonna go into some, there's some other things other than environmental consequences as well. Um, so environmentally, the increased dependence upon cars in areas that are sprawled or spread out, suburban residents drive twice as much as urban residents because everything's spread out. You can't walk to anything. And you're certainly not going to walk down the freeway feeder road to get to, I don't know, Walmart that's down there. That's just not, it's not a doable thing. Suburban homes are larger than urban ones. And so housing, the actual footprint of the house, takes about, up about twice as much land as in an urban environment. Additionally, larger houses take more energy to heat and cool, so that has an environmental impact. Urban sprawl also tends to occur at the edge of cities, meaning that as that city spreads out, um, what it's taking over was what used to be farmland. So we're increasing the distance between farms and consumers, people who eat the food, which leads to increased fossil fuel emissions in order to transport food. So what's not here is some of the consequences that are not environmental, and they also weren't in your textbook, but I'd like to, to touch on them just a little bit. Um, studies have shown that people who live in suburban areas, kind of in the midst of urban sprawl, tend to have um, greater symptoms of depression. Scientists are not 100% sure why, but people who live in suburbs frequently do not have um, prolonged human contact. They get in their car in the morning, 
They drive to wherever they work, they do their job, and then they go home. They are disconnected. They tend to be disconnected from their communities, and that leads to a sense of isolation and greater feelings of depression. Additionally, there tends to be much more competition in terms of who's got the bigger house and the and the um, uh, the greater number of things um, for people who live in the suburbs, and that can also contribute to feelings of inadequacy and depression. This was actually on an FRQ um, two years ago, so that's why I'm kind of mentioning these. The other thing is is that when you walk less, when you drive twice as much as urban residents, your health tends to be poorer. So. Um, People who live in the suburbs um, can have higher rates of obesity just due to the fact that they're spending more time in the car and they're not walking as much. The other thing that can happen there is that, um, that because they're spending time in the car commuting, um, they may end up, with less exercise, they may end up with cardiovascular disease due to either reduced exercise or poor eating habits because they're eating on the go instead of sitting down and having meals because they're running out of time to do so. All right, so why did we get in this situation? Why do we have this sprawl around cities? Well, the main reason is that in the 1950s, um, the rise of the automobile and the interna interstate highway system. The, the automobile became, I mean, that's what every American family wanted, was to have their own car. And then we were building the interstate highway system, which made it very easy to get from place to place. And that is the primary cause of sprawl. Um, some other reasons are increasing urban cost of living. Land is cheaper outside of urban areas. So when developers began placing houses out there, the taxes and the housing prices were lower. So that attracted a lot of um, uh, servicemen returning from World War II. They were getting GI housing benefits and they were looking for the biggest house for the least amount of money. Well, they weren't finding those in urban areas. They were finding them in these um, suburban areas which were uh, newly built specifically for returning GIs from World War II. Um, and this, this is kind of the rise of the suburb um, right after World War II, re, uh, returning GIs. The third reason is urban blight. And you can see that that's bolded because that's a key term. Urban blight is the degradation of social environments in the city that often accompanies and accelerates migration to the suburbs. You know, people have this idea of the city as a dirty place, as a dangerous place. Um, and so people have left, you know, there, there was times where people have left cities. Um, typically the people who have the mobility and the money to move tend to be white. So there is a term called white flight. Urban blight often, often leads to white flight where um, more affluent members of the population can leave the blighted inner city and they go to the suburbs, but that leaves highly concentrated minority populations in the city center, and the suburbs tend to be very white and um, not very diverse. And you can see many instances of that in, uh, in cities um, around the United States, where the whites got freaked out living in the city center, and they left, and they went to these, um, these suburbs and kind of established their own little white enclaves, and in the cities, we ended up with concentrated populations of uh, minority communities. Government policies have also contributed to urban sprawl. Uh, the Highway uh, Trust Fund is funded by gasoline tax. So when you fill your car up with gasoline, you're actually contributing to this. Um, the Highway Trust Fund is used to pay for the construction and maintenance of highways. Well, the gas, because there's more highways, you have to buy more gas. The more gas you buy, the more highways you construct because you're, you're contributing to the fund. So that's kind of a positive feedback loop there, right? Gotta buy gas because you gotta drive, gotta drive because uh, there's more freeways, do, 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 do. One influences the other in this positive feedback loop. So this highway trust fund has, um, has contributed to urban sprawl. Zoning laws are also at fault. Um, many zoning laws have prevented suburbs from developing a main street retail area. Uh, and this has to do with, um, in the suburbs, there's density restrictions. And so the zoning laws say you can't have uh, so many 
different types of businesses per square foot. So you've got the, you've got to have the retail spread out and you have to have retail separate from housing, separate from education. So, I mean, Mesquite's a prime example. Mesquite is a suburb. And, you know, when you think about where the schools are, where the houses are, and where, like, things like the grocery stores are, they're not usually within walking distance of one another. I mean, you have to get in a car and drive, or you have to get in the bus and go there. That's the result of zoning laws. Um, you know, t communities that developed naturally before zoning laws came into effect, um, you know, they had these main street areas. Cities have these main streets where you can go and shop there. And Mesquite has a downtown main street. It's over by, you know, Mesquite High School, and y'all well, have probably been there. But how many of you go there on a regular basis to do all your shopping? Not very many people. There's not a grocery store over there. I mean, it's not a true mixed-use retail area. The other thing that um, has contributed are federally subsidized mortgages. Um, federally subsidized mortgages offer good mortgage terms, but they have to be in low-risk areas. So when the government classifies low-risk areas, those most often fall in suburban areas. They consider urban areas more high risk in terms of many factors. And so you couldn't get a federally subsidized mortgage for a first time home buyer in an urban area, you had to go to a suburban area. So let's talk a little bit about smart growth. Smart growth is kind of a buzzwordy thing um, for me, but it is a concept that you need to know. So one approach to the reduction in urban sprawl is this idea of smart growth. Smart growth focuses on strategies that encourage dense, sustainable, and healthy communities. The basic, the basic principles of smart growth are, and there's 10 of them, so stick with me, mixed land use, meaning that you have residential, retail, educational, recreational, and business um, uh, land use all in a compact area, which means you can walk, you can bike, and there's less driving to get to, to all the things you need. So think about like Main Street USA, right? You had the bank was there, you could go get, you know, a cup of coffee was there, you could go to a green grocer, so it's like a little grocery store. Um, you could send your kids to school, it was within walking or biking distance. This is the idea, that things are in, in within one or two miles and you can walk or bike there. Uh, the second principle is to create a range of housing opportunities and choices, meaning that people of all incomes can be included and that there's all different types of housing. There might be apartments, there might be condos, there might be single family homes, um, and they're all kind of mixed in together. Uh, walkable neighborhoods, more sidewalks, less parking lots or parking lots behind buildings, dense multi-use developments, all of these encourage pedestrian use. They're, they're really focusing on walkable neighborhoods. Encouraging community involvement in planning and development decisions, the smart growth feels that stakeholders should be um, involved in the process of development questions. So encouraging all community members to come to um, development committee meetings and all that stuff, that's real big in smart growth. Taking advantage of compact building design. Uh, compact building design means building up instead of out. So in smart growth, you'd want your buildings to be taller, not wider. So some of the uh, continuing smart growth, we want to encourage distinctive and attractive communities with a unique sense of place. Like the textbooks give you, gives you the example of the French Quarter in New Orleans. If you don't know what the French Quarter is, first off, you need to live a little and go out and visit it. But second off, off look it up. So the French Quarter is a unique urban space it's distinctive, it's attractive, and people go there. Um, everything can be, um, it's a very walkable area, and everything that you need can be purchased or, or um, uh, obtained within this, this one unique area. The preservation of open spaces, farmland, natural beauty, and critical environmental areas. So by concentrating humans into kind of dense multi-use areas, we can preserve these open spaces, we can preserve our farmland um, and these environmental areas, and we don't sprawl into them. Provide a variety of transportation choices, such as pedestrian areas, bike-friendly design, light rail, car and ride-sharing networks, all of these. Um, different ways to get around. 
strengthen, invigorate, and direct development towards existing communities rather than encouraging people to leave for a suburb. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback on this. So for families, one of the reasons that families leave cities is because the quality of schools or the perceived quality of schools. Now, it may not be true, but people perceive city schools as being <clears throat> less rigorous and of lesser quality than suburban schools. That is certainly not always the case, and in many times that is, that's a fallacy. However, um, smart growth seeks to strengthen and, and invigorate the systems and the communities within these existing areas rather than saying, well, okay, we're just going to flee and hope it's better in a suburb. Uh, connected to that is this idea of infill. Infill is development that fills in vacant lots within existing communities rather than expanding into new land. If you go through any urban area, you're going to see vacant lots. So infill would be when a developer builds on the vacant lot instead of opening up new land. And last but not least, make development decisions predictable, transparent, fair, and cost-effective. This kind of goes back to the shareholder issue or the stakeholder issue. People need to be involved in the development decisions of their community. They need to understand the development con uh, the development conventions. They need to be invited to meetings um, and not kept out of the process. Every, it needs to be open to everyone. And um, development needs to be cost effective. So you don't have multi-million dollar uh, development decisions in the hands of a few very wealthy developers. Um, this is everyone's community and everybody needs to be involved. The end.